So we spent the first hour talking about how bodies die and normal dying. We'd like to talk now about how to take care of you, the caregivers. And I have said for a long time that I think healthcare doesn't really recognize caregivers and really how hard it is to be a caregiver. And it's it's one of those things where I've, they say practice what you preach or yada yada, right? And I've gotten to experience being a caregiver over the last four weeks. And it's interesting that I, I've not been that far off. I, I was worried that what I had been teaching made me not true, but it's been okay. It's 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 holding up to experience. So let's talk a little bit about caregivers. Uh, as I said in the first hour, you have to really give some physicians just a tiny bit of slack. We are type A driven people. We really want to be right all of the time. We want you to acknowledge us as right, or at least you know bear with us and pretend we're right. Uh, we sleep deprived for a decade. We're not socially apt most of the time. And then you know you put us into a situation of conflict or sadness and we just don't really know what to do with ourselves. So that is particularly true in watching physicians deal with caregivers. And, and this is not only of physicians. I have watched nurses tell caregivers, your loved one is my patient, you are not my patient. That breaks my heart. Because honestly, when we're talking about dying, and, and I teach this all the time, when my patient who is dying is comfortable, my focus shifts to the caregivers. The caregivers are the ones at the bedside. The caregivers are the ones who are going to survive this loss. The caregivers are the ones who can have this make or break for them in the time that they're going through the death. So I think that there is much more focus starting now on caregivers in the health industry. I don't think it's where it needs to be. And I uh, encourage, I really encourage forums like these because I think the more we all can be educated, the more we can understand how we ourselves are caregivers, but also help our doctors understand what it is to be a caregiver. Um, I, docs just aren't trained in it and, and I don't think healthcare is really understanding yet what we need to be looking at. As we did last hour, I'm going to start the lecture with two stories, and I'm not going to tell you the end of the story, so you have to just wait to get to the end of the tale if you want to hear it. The first uh, story is about Anne. Anne is 55 years old. She has lung cancer. It was widely metastatic at diagnosis, but she was still trying chemotherapy to see if she could buy some time. She came to the hospital with a condition that I have never seen since, and I was actually told I was in training. I was told by my attending I would probably see it this one time in my career and never, ever see it again. The syndrome is called white clot syndrome, and it was her white cells beginning to create clots throughout her body. Normally, when we cut ourselves and we bleed, our platelets are these little tiny cells that come to the rescue first, and they start to get sticky. They catch red cells, and we create that clot or that scab. And so she now is clotting her body with all of these white cells. She has been to the operating room. She has had one leg cut off because it was completely gangrenous. When she hit the hospital, it was already purple and cold. And she's now in the ICU. Her heart rate, and she's on life support, her heart rate is 185. Her blood pressure is 40 over 20. And her oxygen level is 20. And I get called. The second patient is Kathleen. Kathleen is 16. Kathleen has a bone cancer that started in her femur. It has now metastasized throughout her body. Almost every single one of her bones has cancer in it. Most notably with Kathleen, it is her spine. Every vertebra has cancer, and she is having tremendous pain because those cancer cells and those tumors are pushing against all the nerves that come out of your spinal cord. And so Kathleen is, is writhing in bed, screaming, and I was called when she was on 900 milligrams an hour of morphine, awake and screaming. Care does not feel the same, right? So when you think about caring for a baby or a toddler, spoon feeding them, putting them in diapers, watching them fall down, tending to their owies, feels different than if you're caring for someone who is dying or an elder, right? Changing adult briefs is just disgusting. I mentioned my mother who has skin failure. She talks a lot about her adult briefs. I, one, don't really need to hear about it. Two, it just grosses me out. And three, I don't wanna go smell her trash can, right? She's always worried about the smell in her house and wants me to check her trash can. I don't want to. It just doesn't feel cool at all. Spoon feeding somebody who has had a stroke and watching things fall out of their mouth doesn't feel like spoon feeding a toddler. Watching an adult fall down and break a hip is tragic. 
And we know that in elders who have ground level falls that break hips, their mortality is 20% the next year. It's, it's tragic. These falls are just tragic. And yet we don't give a lot of press to them. We don't teach people until they find themselves stuck in the moment that this was actually a horrible thing and really pretty devastating to go through. And I would argue that the, the care that feels okay, taking care of an infant or a toddler feels okay because it ends. It's short lived and things get better, right? The infant learns how to spoon feed themselves. The toddler learns how to not need diapers anymore. The five-year-old learns how to tie her own shoes. My granddaughter is eight. She knows exactly where the Band-Aids are. She's great at putting them on me and everybody else. So they learn how to do things for themselves. It gets better with time. However, caregiving that doesn't feel okay, watching these tragic things happen, taking care of a dying person, doesn't really end in anything that's better. It may feel interminable. It may feel like this is going to kill me. And I have caregivers lose so much of themselves in the role of caregiving. And it's really been fascinating over my career to have a few caregivers who really lose their identity completely. And so when I am dealing with somebody who's in my ICU, uh, one of our most notorious patients was 94. He had had multiple strokes. He was completely bedbound. There's no way in hell the man could have fed himself, let alone wiped his own tushy. He had special glasses made by his family because he couldn't sit up. So they would they made these prism glasses that he could see the television. He was fed by a tube in his stomach. He had a tracheostomy tube to be repeatedly attached to the ventilator. And, and the, the ICU team was beside themselves that this man was kept alive. His daughter was at bedside 24-7. Always. She went home for 30 minutes a day to shower, and then she was back at bedside. She had no identity other than being his caregiver. There was no way she could bring herself to even begin thinking that he could die because then she had nothing in her life. She couldn't figure out how to be on the planet any other way. So there's this whole balance about life, right? Balance of how hard you live and how hard you play. Balance of how well you live and how well you die. Balance of who you are. And I think that that's where we are struggling now with caregivers in the healthcare industry is trying to understand how do we find that balance to keep the caregivers whole and intact inside their own persona, their own life. I'm going to go through each of these because this is what my families have expressed to me over the years. Now, I remind, remind you that we started by talking about doctors are conflict adverse, sleep deprived for a decade, and socially inept. So when we have families start expressing any of these emotions to us, our tendency is to try and hide, hit the door and try and run as fast as we can. And we come across as rude or cold or uncaring when we do that. Actually, most of the docs I know, especially the ones who run for the door the fastest, are the most emotional and the most sensitive. And they have no idea how to be with themselves and how to bear witness to suffering. And so, again, as we think about caregivers, really trying to remember that that is what we don't know yet. We don't know how to bear witness to suffering, how to look at you sitting in the middle of a situation that isn't going to end anytime soon and say, man, that really sucks. We just don't know how to do it well. And I think that as human beings, we don't really know how to do it well. And so we always hear things like, oh, call me if I can help. Well, that means I have to define what help I need, right? And so I might call to say, hey, take my husband out to lunch because I have to work. And I will tell you that felt so weird to me to reach out to somebody for something so mundane. I, and it wasn't even like, you know, get him on the toilet. It literally was take him out to lunch. And so really trying to understand as human beings, how do we help each other learn to be caregivers and, and how do we ask for help when we are caregivers and what is that defined by? Because people want to help. It is innate really, I think, in most human beings to want to help and really not know how. So all of my families over the years have expressed anger in some way, shape or form. It could be anger at Kaiser Permanente where I work. They missed the diagnosis. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. You discharged him too early. There's lots of comments about the healthcare system at large. And I will, I will contend that yes, the healthcare system is, is clunky. It doesn't really work very well. It's not sensitive to the needs that we're seeing in our aging boomers right? Because we don't really provide care at home very well. We don't understand how to pay for caregivers. We don't understand the social needs of healthcare and how to address those. It's communities like this one that are beginning to think about those things, but healthcare at large really is not. 
It might be anger at whoever gave you news, right? Because I am so devastated by this horrible news that I'm hearing that my loved one is going to die. And I don't know, I don't know where to put that. I don't know what to do with that emotion. So I'm going to lash out at anybody or anything. I have watched caregivers be angry at the patient, angry that they have the gall to die, right? Angry that they have the gall to get sick, angry that they, they have the gall to even begin doing things. I often see this where there's been couples that one person really did most of the work, right? So you see it, it used to be that you would see it in these really cute 90 year old ladies whose husband did all of the pumping of the gas and paid the bills and, and now the husband's dying. And this poor woman is like, I, I don't know how to pump the gas. I don't know how to pay the bills. I don't know where the accounts are. I, I, I don't know. And, and they're so angry at their loved one. The other thing that I see is anger at the loved one for having the disease in the first place. I see this a lot in folks who have history of substance abuse. And now we're dealing with some complication or sequelae of substance abuse. I had a patient who was dying of hepatocellular carcinoma that comes from injection drug use usually and hepatitis C infection. So he had been an injection drug user for many, many, many years. He had known he had had hep C for many, many years. Now he's got this cancer and he's going to die of it. And so he's there with his daughter and his wife and there must have been some anger at him over the years because I hear I, he wanted something out of his chart. And so I had my back to them in the computer pulling whatever they wanted out of the chart. And I hear him say, I'm sorry, I was such a shit. And I didn't turn around. I just said, did I just hear you call yourself a shit? And he goes, uh, were you, I don't know. I don't know if you were supposed to hear that. And I turned around and I looked at his wife and his daughter and I said, was he a shit at one time? And his wife said, oh, hell yeah. I said, is he a shit now? And his wife said, no. And I looked at him and I said, it would seem to me that if you were a shit now, they wouldn't be here, right? It sounds like you made some terrible choices. It sounds like you have some right for regret of choices you made in the past, but these two women wouldn't be here if they didn't love you. And so whatever anger they might've had, they're working through it. And so patient, I'm gonna ask you to work through it as well and try and find some forgiveness for yourself. And ultimately, when all is said and done, regardless of whatever behaviors we engaged in in our lifetime, I'm pretty sure no one asks to die of cancer. I'm pretty sure no one asks to die of emphysema. I am certain no one asks to die of dementia. These things happen. We are carbon-based life forms. The carbon base wears out. Our DNA begins to get faulty. Things change and we die. And so I really work a lot with my families around the fact that you can be completely angry and pissed off and then we're going to miss out on some of the sacred things that could be happening. And, and you're going to get through the death and it's not going to feel better. Or we can start dealing with what's going down and getting real about it and, and begin coping with this anger and see if we can't get to something that's sacred. My experience is that anger is always on top of something else, usually extreme sadness or abject terror. And so if I can get to the abject terror and what are we really frightened about? or that sadness and bear witness to the sadness and bear witness to the suffering, then we can start moving past the anger into something that's a little bit more productive. But guilt is always in the way, right? I should have said more. I should have done more. I should have been there more. I should have made him stop drinking. I should have made her stop smoking. I should have recognized the signs of cancer. I should have recognized world hunger. I should have recognized that the, that the sky was, it was growing cloudy, right? We, we can make ourselves guilty about anything. And again, guilt becomes a waste of energy. At the end of the day, it doesn't allow me to be present to my loved one. It doesn't allow me to be present to myself and to this heartbreak that's occurring inside me. It doesn't allow me to grow when I have an opportunity to grow here. Guilt is really difficult and guilt is on part of both the part of the patient and the family. I'm watching now with my mother trying to make everybody around her feel guilty. So she is so angry at how her life is going and how it is not meeting her expectations. Now, mind you, she's not doing anything she could be to try and make her life meet her expectations, but it's not going the way she wants. It won't go the way she wants. And she's so angry about that, that her, her response is to just look at somebody and say, well, you could have called me yesterday and you didn't, well, you could stay here another hour. What do you mean you're leaving? Right? She's really trying to take all of that anger and push it into guilt 
on someone else. And honestly, I really believe what's driving her is she knows she could have been different. She knows she could have made different choices. So I think she's got her own guilt that she can't really deal with. And so she's pushing it out to those around her. I mean, she maybe is just flipping crazy too. I don't really know, but um, God bless her. And you know, the, the caregivers, I think really struggle. I have a patient right now and he's on hospice and his, his cancer was metastatic at diagnosis, meaning it was never going to be cured. He tried round one of chemo and type one of chemo because his family wanted him to. They wanted him to put in the good fight. And it was horrible. Not only did he feel terrible, he looked terrible, life didn't go well, and his cancer grew. It just looked at the chemo and laughed and said, ha, 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 and just kept growing. So they said, well, you know, we've got second line chemotherapy. And anytime an oncologist says second line or third line, that means worse and worse and worse, right? It doesn't mean stronger and better. We don't save the best for last. We, we start with the best. And he really did not wish to go forward with second line chemotherapy. And his wife said, oh, but you have to, you have to fight. You have to try. You need to go forward. You have to try it. And so he tried it and he felt horrible. And so then he gets referred to me because he's feeling so bad physically. And I looked at his wife and I said, have you gotten to see his pictures of his CAT scans and what he looks like on the inside? She said, no, I've not. I said, would you like to look at his pictures and see what he looks like on the inside? And she said, actually, that would help a lot. Because on the outside, this man was still robust. He still had good color. He still had a hearty laugh. He still had a wicked sense of humor. On the inside, you could see the wildfire that was cancer that was spreading through his body. And when she saw those pictures, she was so bereft. She had to leave the room for about 10 minutes. And she came back to the room drying her tears. And she said, I had no idea. If I had known that's what he was doing, I never would have pushed for more chemotherapy. I never would have made him do that. And she's still holding that guilt to this day. And, and, and he and I are working on her to say, let it go, right? Get over it. It's okay. He tried it. He was a, a big boy when he made that decision. And my experience is that patients and families always make decisions that make sense for the information they have at the time. You didn't have the information of what it looked like. So now you do. And now you make different choices. There is also that abject desperation, right? Especially in couples that are long lived. When you start looking at couples of four, five, and six decades, it is not just losing a spouse, it's losing half your body. And so being very sensitive to what a survivor is going to go through. And I will tell families very frankly and honestly, adult child, it's one thing for you to lose this parent. But for your mom, who's going to survive the loss of your dad, it's something completely different. And your dad is gonna need your wish that you're gonna take care of mom. Your dad is gonna need your promise that you're gonna take care of mom. Studies have repeatedly showed that couples of five and six years, five, excuse me, five and six decades of marriage and duration, when one dies, the other follows usually pretty quickly, right? And that makes sense to me. They have been so entwined at spirit, hip, and body. It's really difficult for them to live without the other. My grandmother, I mentioned in the first lecture, died at 88 of COPD 18 years after her pancreatic cancer was cut out of her body. Her husband died four years prior to her. And I fully expected, because it was a six-decade marriage, I fully expected her to die in that next year after he did. She spent that whole year empty in the house. She was amazing. She was like one of the um, Tasmanian devils, just spinning through the house like nobody's business. She had all his clothes out within two weeks of his death. She had his tools out within three months of his death. She had his car gone within six months of his death. I mean, she just had everything wiped out and and everything that was left in the house she had labeled, right? So I got the cuckoo clock. My brother got the chair. My father got the guns. I mean, everything was labeled. And, and she got to the end of that first year, and I thought, well, crap, what is she going to do now? <laughs> She's kind of done everything. And, and then she hung on for a little bit longer, and I think for her, it was fear and desperation. My grandmother was one of those that um, found herself uh, pregnant very young. Uh, you know, it was in the days when they didn't talk about how babies got made, so all of a sudden she finds herself pregnant, and she's in high school. And she was so devastated that she did that to her mother. And then she, she made the mistake of marrying a guy in the mob, so that didn't go so well for her. And, um, and she was devastated by that. 
that, that she made such bad choices. And in her desperation of all of these bad choices that she has now carried with her 70 years, she never could get to the point to forgive herself. 70 years later, she still thought that she had messed up my dad and she had messed up this and that her mother hated her. Now her mother's been dead 35 years, right? But she has all of this stuff. And it took her another three years after cleaning out after grandpa to get all of that desperation worked through. And what I find in my caregivers is that they too are desperate, paying the bills, getting gas in the car, figuring out where the money is, figuring out how the accounts work. Oh my God, what is a trust? What do you mean I have to do the pool? I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I, we joke in my house, but it's true. I cannot turn on my television. If that man decides to die, I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm gonna have to hire somebody to come in and rewire the whole damn thing. I can't find it. I don't know. I have no idea how to get the damn thing on, right? So that desperation of how do you do anything, right? And if this has been half my life, how do I do anything at all? How do I make life meaningful? How do I go forward? That desperation is real, and I don't, dep- I don't downplay it, and I don't decry it. We talk about it because it is there, and it, and it is meaningful. There is just a lot of frustration in healthcare as well. There's frustration in life. So if I'm in a body that's dying, how do I handle that? God bless my mother. She's, she's become fairly mean and nasty, right? And my brother is so frustrated that she won't just die already. Seriously, and I can appreciate that, right? She's not living. She's stuck in a chair. She needs someone to help her up. She's two people to get on the toilet. That's kind of a crummy life, but she's not dying. No, heck no, right? She's gonna complain about every single one of those caregivers and she's not going anywhere. And my brother is completely frustrated and then hates himself for being frustrated. When my father-in-law was dying, God bless him, he lived 14 years with dementia. And um, in the last five years of his life, he kept getting these heart blocks where he would just faint. And he'd go down cold as a mackerel and pulseless. And it was one of those things where the family, the first time it happened, they're calling 911 and oh my God, and what do we do? And by the third time, they're like, yeah, dad's down, right? <laughs> No, don't call 911. It's fine. It's, it, it, he'll come back. And, and it was almost like the old tube televisions, right? You know, when the old tube televisions would die, and, and before they died, they'd get fuzzy, and you could hit the television, and you'd get a picture for a while. So Papa Joe would do that. He'd be getting fuzzy. He'd go down, and then he'd wake up, hey, right? Like nothing had happened. And the poor family was just getting more and more and more tired because Joe was getting more and more and more demented. And when he finally went down for the last time, my poor husband was like, oh, we've got weeks still. He's not gonna go, you watch, you watch. He's gonna come back just because that's what he does, right? And the priest came in to bless him and and my sister-in-law was so anxious about calling the priest because she's called for last rites six times. (laughs) And she was really worried that she was pissing off the priest and I said, I kind of think it's his job, it's okay. (laughs) And the priest came and blessed Joe and looked at him and said, Joe, if you don't go this time, they're gonna take the pillow to your face. And I looked at the priest and I said, Father, I do this for a living and I would never say that out loud. <laughs> I probably wouldn't think it either, but, um, but he was really very irreverent, which was kind of funny for a priest, right? And it was interesting because I think these adult children needed that degree of irreverence because they were so tired and so frustrated that God bless him, Joe just kept doing the Energizer Bunny. It's like, it's okay, Joe, it's okay now. We're all okay. You're okay. Your wife isn't going to yell at you for being late. Just head on up. Show her a good time. So there's frustration with everything. And and that's one thing I find with my caregivers is they are exhausted and they're frustrated. And so we just have to be gentle around that because it is not easy. There's nothing easy in caregiving. There's nothing easy in living with illness. There's nothing easy in dying. And so we really have to just acknowledge, yes, you're frustrated. And, and I will have family members, you know, apologize. They'll apologize for crying or they'll apologize for being cranky or crabby. And I'll just say, you're allowed, right? I mean, and if you yell at me, I might, I might you know, make a quip back, but we're fine. I, I get that this is just a behavior because this is such a hard thing you're going through. That bewilderment, right, of, of how did I get here? What, what do you, I mean, we married for life until death do us part, and it's not time for that yet. 
And, and what do you mean that you've got this thing that's happening in your body? And that just doesn't make sense to me. We talked in the first hour about how things can seem fairly sudden, right? A cancer patient can be living along doing just fine, but they're losing energy and all of a sudden they hit that critical mass of energy loss and they crater out and die. And I have these families looking at me like, how, how, did, we, how, how did we get here? We were just shopping two weeks ago. How, how did this happen, right? My demented dad was walking just fine till he broke his hip and now now you're telling me he's dying and it's only like five days after his hip surgery. How, how did we get here? How, how did this happen? And so having a lot of gentle converse, conversation about what happens to a human body, what is normal dying? that it is okay to have this sense of explain this to me. That's why I always am letting patients see their own chart. I'm showing them x-rays, I'm showing them CAT scans, I'm letting them see their PET scan because that helps calm this bewilderment of how did we get here? And I'm always kind of shocked at doctors who don't do that, right? It just makes sense if you can kind of get a whole picture of what's going on. And that question of how do I be? How do I be when you're sick? How do I try and honor you and make sure that I give you as much independence as you can have, but am there when you need me? How am I going to be when you're not with me? My husband and I still laugh. Several years ago, I had these big old neck um, nodes and neck masses, and, and he had written me off as dead. And he already had it in his mind that he couldn't travel to Disney anymore, and he couldn't go to Hawaii anymore, and he couldn't go to New York anymore because those were things we did together. How do I be, right? And, and it turned out to be cat scratch disease. I'm fine. But, but how do I be? How, how does this world work when the only person and thing and way of being I've ever known is changing? That bewilderment is so palpable. And that overwhelming sadness. And I think this is what humans shy away from. This is definitely when doctors shy away from. We don't know how to bear witness to sadness. Doctors are trained to fix you. We have tools, we have drugs, we have chemicals, we have x-rays, we have stuff to fix you. And when you have the gall to have something that's not fixable, God, we don't know what to do. We really struggle with that. And so then we try and do more tests. And when I was in training, we used to talk about the fact that you couldn't die unless your sodium was normal and we had given you a course of steroids just because there was something we could do. And I see that in my oncologist now. I see that in my, in my specialists. There's stuff they can do, so they want to do stuff because then they don't have to deal with this sadness. What I see in my primary care docs, especially at Kaiser Permanente that I, I actually really love, is we have primary care docs who have patients for 20 and 30 years, the whole of their career. And when those patients get sick and die, those primary care docs mourn. They actually really grieve the loss of these patients because they've known them for so long. Right? So there is this abject sadness on, this, on everybody's part. And you'll find in my hospitals that nurses will walk out of a room and they are abjectly sad. And it is watching the family that makes them sad. I had a patient years ago who raised St. Bernard's. That was his hobby. And, and he still had Bernard's. He lived several miles away from the hospital up on a hill because, you know, Bernard's are big, so you got to have some room for him. And he was dying. And I called his wife and I said, I don't think he's going to leave the hospital, but he wants to see the dogs. Can you bring them down? And I'll bundle him up and get him outside and we'll go play with the dogs. And so she said, sure. And then I don't hear from her. Three hours have gone by and I'm not hearing from her and I'm getting a little bit nervous. So I walk to his room and I open the door and go... <laughs> She had brought in 100 pounds of dog. No, forgive me. She had brought in 250 pounds. She had two Bernards and a German Shepherd. The nurse was beside herself because, well, let's face it, Bernards drool a lot, right? So there's just puddles of <laughs> Bernard drool all over the floor. And the nurse was just beside herself. She was so upset. And I looked at her and I said, write me up. It's fine. You can call my boss. Here's his number. I don't care. This man needs this, right? because he's dying and he needed to see these dogs. This is what mattered to him. And it turned out the, the patient was in a double room and his roommate was thrilled to have the dogs there, right? There was like, oh, dogs, ah, dogs. And, and his wife was thrilled and they were able to renew their vows. That was something that was a bucket list wish for them, item for them and they hadn't done it. So they renewed their vows in front of the dogs as witness. But that's, you know, it's a great story, and yet you feel the sadness underneath it, right? And so that, that whole sadness, and, and my nurse who was so mad, what she was mad at, okay, so the floor's dirty, but 
she was mad at how sad it was, that there was so much love in that room, that it was palpable, and it was ending. And, and she couldn't get into the sadness, so she got angry. And, and we all do that as humans, right? We, we, we can get so far into something that's painful, and then we have to either back away or we get mad at it. That's normal human behavior. The other thing that my survivors tell me is I am in such a horrible place. One of my colleagues had to watch her dad die last month. And, and her dad was her everything. And she said, I just don't get it. I don't get how these people are working and I don't get how they're driving to the store and it's disgusting that they're shopping. This whole thing, right, of normal human life continuing on when her life felt like it had stopped that day that he, she was in the hospital with his death. And really trying to work with her around, it's not your time to die. You can stop living your life, it's fine, but you're not dying yet. So that's a long time to sit in nothing, to sit in this sadness. There might be another way to begin to approach and to reemerge into life that is different. You can't go back to the old life. It's fundamentally changed. He died. But you can live your life and adopt a new way. And, and it's been really wonderful to watch her this last month working to find a new way of how to be. And that abject terror, right? In my colleague's world, she could not picture life without her dad. She was in a funk and a depression that was so bad, she didn't know what to do with herself. And it was interesting because they kept having all of these great stories about how he was spiritually touching them. At the moment of his death, his son had a movie reel running in his head, he said, of all of these pictures of himself as a child with his dad and growing up with his dad and then as an adult with his dad. And when I pronounced his dad dead, the movie, the movie stopped. And they had done and taken dad's ashes and they had spread them where they wanted to be. And mom had found jewelry that she, hadn't, she had lost 20 years prior from dad. So they had all of these great stories of how dad was reaching out and touching them even after his death. And my partner was just beside herself and so, so distraught because she wasn't feeling it. He wasn't coming to her. And she called me probably three weeks after his death and she said, do you have a minute? I said, of course, I always have a minute for you. And she said, I gotta tell you about the dream I had last night. I said, tell me about the dream you had. I was in quicksand, I was drowning, I was going down, my head was almost under the surface and my dad reached down and pulled me up. And I said, so you found him? She said, I found him. I said, so love isn't dead yet? She said, no, love isn't dead. His spirit is with you, I think it is. I don't know. It's kind of weird. I'm a doctor. I'm a surgeon. This doesn't work right for me, right? So she, she was able to immediately digress back into what we doctors do. But dad pulled her up. She was able to finally feel him a little bit. And they're starting to talk about how they're going to keep dad alive now on Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and celebrating traditions that they would do. But it's going to be different. But that terror of how do I be and what do I do and, and how do I make things go forward? And what happens if I go crazy? I think that's the biggest thing I see in my caregivers. I'm losing a complete sense of who I am, and that means I'm crazy. I'm just going to fall apart. My life is going to be meaningless and worthless. Nothing's going to go well anymore. And that's huge for me. And I jump on caregivers who start doing that behavior with me. And I'm very blunt. And I'll tell caregivers, it's his turn to die, not yours. Hearts break open. They don't break apart. Love does not die. And I don't believe spirits die either. And I think that there is purpose in all of this and meaning for you and gift for you if I can help find the way and help you get there. And it may not be me. It may be that I get you to a, a religious leader. It may be that I get you to a social worker. It may be that I get you to a chaplain. It may be that I get you to your favorite aunt. It may not be me. But we've got to help you find a way to keep putting one foot in front of the other because it's not your time yet. So I have seen all of these things in my caregivers. Loss of health is a huge one. I have so many caregivers, I love it, because they'll come in and tell me, well, I'm diabetic and I haven't eaten and I haven't taken my meds. I'm like, well, I'm a doctor, that just makes me feel so much better about my day. <laughs> what? And so, you know, I am, I am notorious for bringing in food. I'm also Italian. So I'm notorious for bringing in food regardless and, and really forcing this issue, right? And I'll tell caregivers, you know, if you faint, I have paperwork and I'm going to make it about me. I don't want to do the paperwork. Thank you. So you're going to stay hydrated. You're going to eat something. I can't have you lose your health because if my caregiver loses his or her health, my patient is up a creek without a paddle. 
I need my caregivers healthy. And when I talk about patients going home with hospice and it's just a couple, there's no one else, we talk about the fact that I need someone else in that home because I need the caregiver to have the ability to shower and sleep and eat, right? I can't have the caregiver lose health. And there have been study after study after study where we have these couples go home and the caregiver trying to pull 23 hour days and the caregiver strokes or the caregiver falls and breaks a hip. And now we're really in trouble because now I've got two people and I've got nothing in, in place for them. So I really harp on my caregivers to maintain their health. They have to take their medications. They have to follow through. And I've had caregivers where I walk them to the emergency department or I call their doctor and say, I need you to see so-and-so. I need you to reach out because I'm worried and I can't lose this caregiver. I need them. And caregivers pretty consistently lose weight. I don't know how many have told me, yeah, this is a great diet. I've been trying to get these pounds off. <laughs> If you really needed to lose the weight, I'll give that to you for a day or two, but then I'm going to be on you. And I get that caregivers get nauseous. I get that eating is not easy. So I'll ask them to at least drink things with calories, right? This is not the time to go for Diet Coke. Go for the real stuff, right? I'd rather see you do a smoothie or a milkshake. I don't care if we get square meals in. I just need you to stay hydrated and not lose so much weight that I lose your health. I have caregivers who just lose purpose completely and lose direction, right? My little daughter who's in the ICU 24 seven watching her dad wear his prism glasses to watch TV that he can't understand and he can't relate to. There is no purpose for her in her life as she's defined it except to be at his bedside. So when he dies, there is no purpose for her in this lifetime as she's defined it. That's tragic. I need her to hold herself and to continue to be herself on the planet. I need all of my caregivers to continue to be who they are on the planet. One of my patients right now has a husband that's completely into baseball and he goes to spring training every fall and he was gonna try and cancel his trip. And she got all up in his business and said, hell no, you're going. You're going to spring training, you're getting out of the house, you're going to play golf once a week with your buddies, you're going to play bridge once a week. You don't have to go five days a week like you used to, but you have to go one. You have to keep those relationships. You have to keep that purpose about you. Because if we lose purpose, then we lose vision, right? We lose the ability to have perspective on what all of this might mean, on how I'm going to continue moving forward. And when I have folks lose vision, then I can't help them make choices. I have an 80-something-year-old patient right now. He's dying of heart failure. His wife is 20 years younger than him, so she's really struggling, right? Because, and she'll tell you, I married a man that was older than me. I married him for death, and better or worse, death until us part. And now that old coot has the gall to try and die. And she's just, she's beside herself. And all she can see is you can't die. You have to take this experimental med. I'm going to take you to another specialist. I'm going to have you do these things. We're going to try this. We're going to try that. And you can see he's tired. You can see that he's just thinking, really? Okay. And he doesn't want to let her down. He doesn't want her to think less of him for not trying. So he's trying to do all these things. But because of that, when he dies suddenly, his body's just going to fall over one of these days. She's not ready. She doesn't have any vision for how to handle that situation. And she's funny to talk to because she'll touch it with me. And she'll say things like, yeah, you know, I expect that he's just going to fall over. or I'm just going to have to pull him off life support. Like, well, you could, I mean, we could wait for it to go that route. We can make a plan to go a different route, but planning means we've got to have some vision and some thought. And she's not into that, really struggling. And so it, it's been interesting to watch this dynamic and to watch how it's going to play out. This idea of community. My mother's doing this, right? No one can help me. Nobody can think the way that I think. Nobody can see what I need. Nobody can understand me. And I find it fascinating to talk to caregivers because there is this sense of my life is imploding. My life is caving in. Nobody else can possibly understand that. And when they start coming out into their church community, to a community like this, to a support group, and realizing they are not alone, that there are other humans who have gone through this, that there are other humans who are going through this, that there are other humans who are just as bewildered and befuddled and terrified. It helps a little bit. 
And so that's why I'm so in my caregiver's business about continuing coffee clutches or continuing book clubs or continuing something that helps keep that sense of community because I can't have them imploding and being alone. And this sense of esteem, I define myself in large part as being a wife. If my husband dies, what happens to me? Am I, am I less of a person? I, I, I don't quite know. Would I travel anymore? Would I, what would I do? And that idea of who am I without you? And so I don't know the right answer for that one, but because I am so far into belief that spirits don't die and love doesn't die, I try to help my caregivers hold their esteem in that space. Life changes. The body isn't here to talk to, but that doesn't mean you can't talk to him. That doesn't mean you can't think about him. That doesn't mean you can't have memories. That doesn't mean that you don't set a place at the table for special occasions, or maybe for the first several weeks or months after death, you set a place at the table every night. Because we have to continue to have that sense of self and esteem. So some things to think about in terms of coping if you are a caregiver. Forgiveness is the first one for me. Forgiveness is big, right? Forgiveness for lots of things. Forgiveness for how I am as a caregiver. Forgiveness for my own selfishness. Forgiveness for my own sadness. Forgiveness for my own overwhelmedness. Because I am sad and overwhelmed and I don't know what I'm doing or what I'm thinking about. And being able to forgive myself for that, having my loved one forgive me for that. My poor husband had his knee replaced and I've been having to try and figure out how to get his ice wrap on him. And every now and then I just jab him and I'm like, I'm so sorry, right? Because I just don't know exactly where your leg is and how to get this stuff and trying to forgive myself for all of those things. But we also find that caregivers need to forgive their loved one. Yes, your loved one is sick and dying. Maybe your loved one had those bad behaviors and made terrible choices when they were younger, and maybe they wouldn't be in this situation if they hadn't made those choices. I have no way of knowing that now. And I tell patients and caregivers all the time, I have no way of knowing that now. I have caregivers get really guilty about, oh, I shouldn't have made them do more chemo, or I shouldn't have gone through the surgery, or I shouldn't have done these things. And I reassure them that, you know what, you made the best choices you could make at the time with the information you have. I had no, I have no concerns. When you come to meet me, I have no concerns about decisions that have been made to this point. This point is just where we are. It's a point in time, and we're going to move forward from here. We're going to talk about options from here. And really um, trying to let go of old things and, and not worry so much about them anymore. I've had several caregivers tell me, um, I, I've had some very devoutly Christian caregivers and the, their loved one has not accepted Jesus Christ as their, their Lord and Savior. That might be really important for the caregiver. It may not be really important for the patient. And so really helping to find some peace around, you can forgive that. If that's not what they want to do, it's okay, right? Because this is your thing and their thing might be a different. It's important for caregivers to jot things down because you have so many things coming at you as a caregiver. They're coming fast, they're coming hard. It's usually stuff you've never dealt with, language you've never learned before. So writing notes down and being able to, to just remember, okay, they said this, they said that, this is what I dotted down. Um, if you are part of a healthcare system that has electronic medical record, don't be afraid to email the doc and say, hey, is this what you said? Because I, I, maybe I didn't write it down correctly. So really being able to jot down things to do, things to know, things you're feeling. It's okay to have all of that in your notebook. And there are lots of folks who want to come forward and help, lots of well-wishers, and they're all going to have questions, and especially around diseases like cancer. Well, did you call MD Anderson? Well, did you call Cancer Center of America? Well, did you call so-and-so? Well, did you, well, you should look at this. Well, did you look at all of the clinical trials? And when you get those kinds of well-wishers, put them on the task of calling the American Cancer Center and right, let, let them do that work because you don't have the time for that unless it's something that feeds your spirit to do. It's really hard for caregivers to delegate, but boy, they need to because you only have so much energy. And when you're taking care of someone else, you only have so much energy. Somebody else can run the vacuum. Somebody else can run to the grocery store. If you have people saying, hey, can I help you? Yeah, could you come get the leaves out of the pool? Or could you be the one that calls that second opinion? Or could you help me figure out getting the car in for its oil change? 
right? You don't have to ask people to come help your loved one get dressed or to see your loved one in a compromised position, but you have a life that is going on around you. You can ask others for help in those realms. Maybe your bills are all paid online by your loved one and your loved one isn't with it enough to help you do that. And you're not so sure. You can ask a friend to say, hey, can you help me figure out how to find these bills so that we can get them paid? All of those things are really useful functional tasks that we just have to kind of think about because we want to help people we just don't necessarily know how to be helpful. There's also things around um, sometimes financial benefits. So I, I'm always joking in Sacramento, we have the Sacramento Municipal District. SMUD offers discounts to people who have oxygen in their home, or they offer discounts to people who have this, and the VA offers aid and attendance kinds of things. So you might actually have qualification to get some extra dollars or in-home support that we physicians will never know. So I will often refer to social workers to see if there are other resources to help my caregivers get through things. I think it's really important for caregivers to get informed. And I have found that family members and patients who tell me I don't want to know really struggle much more than those who want to know. And I get that it is terrifying to get the truth and hear the truth. But what I have found is if I don't allow the truth, if I, if I push the doctors away and I don't allow the truth to be said, things are much harder. And I think bereavement is actually much harder because now my families are in the dark as things are falling apart around them. I do have patients that tell me they just don't want to know. I had a patient several years ago with esophageal cancer. She refused to let her family know what was going on. She knew she had a tumor and she told them she was losing weight because she stopped eating at McDonald's. And so they had no idea what was really going down with her. And when she came into the hospital, now she's an extremist. Things are falling apart. All of the organs are beginning to fail. And she doesn't want to talk about it. And I looked at her and I said, it's okay if you don't want to talk about it. But we are in a point now where we are forced to make some decisions. Are you okay if I talk to your family? and let them make decisions for you. And she's initially said yes to that. And so when I showed her family all of her pictures and how bad this cancer was and how things had been going, it was, it was epiphany for them. They're like, holy crap, this has been going on how long? And she did what? And oh my God, where did that go? And, and they were able to see. And then she found herself in the ICU and I went to her and I said, I'm waiting for your family to come in to make some decisions, but you might wanna make a couple before they get here. The rate things are going, you will be on life support before the end of the day. Do you want that? And she said, no, I, I actually don't. I said, I'm going to tell your family that when they get here. And we're going to make medical plans now that make sense for a woman who wants to be independent, free of machines. And if your death comes, I will make your death comfortable. And so she was able to find some peace in that. She didn't have to dwell a long time. She didn't have to stay in a place that she didn't want to be, but she was able to get her wishes heard. And when her family came, then she didn't have to tell them. I told them. She's dying. She knows it. She doesn't want to be on machines. I'm going to make her comfortable. And the family could say, okay, right? So really being able to have this idea of what's going on. And doctors will follow your lead. So again, doctors are conflict adverse. We're socially inept. We sleep deprived for a decade. You hope that we're going to be able to stay present. We really don't. And if you are angry with us or argumentative or you don't want to hear something, we'll leave. We'll just go to the door. And so we will follow the lead of the family and the patient. And if the patient says, don't tell me anything, doc, I only want positive things and I got nothing positive to offer you, it's a really, really short conversation. And, and, and I've had families get really angry with me because I didn't say anything. And I'm like, I, you said positive only and, and we're kind of between negative and worse. So I, I don't know how to be there with you. And, and I think that that has been much harder on those families. So as much as you can and at the rate that you can, get informed. And there's a, there's a dance to this, right? I'm terrified of what's going on. I can only hear so much information. Great. I can only hear so much information, but doc, when I call you next week, can I get more information? Absolutely. That's not a problem. We'll give you the information at the rate that you can tolerate. Again, don't lose your health. I can't lose my caregivers. I desperately need you for the care of my patients. I rely on you for the care of my patients. <clears throat> and then I need you to take some breaks, right? I, we were talking about a gentleman in the first hour whose wife was dying and he wouldn't leave the hospital. And five days in, he began to literally reek. I mean, the dude just had BO that was nasty. And, and he would not leave. He would not take breaks. He wouldn't go forward. And I said, you know, I need you to be able to take breaks and move away. 
at a patient who was dying and, and his son was an engineer and the engineer wanted to know which organ was going to stop first. I'm like, physician, not a magician. I don't know. And I, you know, we tried to talk about, it. it's like watching a clock stop. I don't know which gear stops first in the clock. It all just kind of winds down at the same time. And he just wasn't buying it and he wouldn't leave the bedside. And I kept saying, you have to leave the bedside. You have to give him a break. I don't think he's going to let you see the final breath. He can tell that you're freaked out. He can tell how uncomfortable you are. He can tell how anxious you are. And as long as you are this anxious and unwilling to leave the bedside and unwilling to give him breaks, he can't go. And we're four days into this, and I went out to the nursing unit, and I could tell we're finally getting close, and I gave the nurses my home number, and I said, call me tonight. He's going to need to talk. So at 11 o'clock, they called, and they said, oh, he needs to talk. I said, I figured. And so he gets on the phone, and, and I said, how are you? And he said, dad's dead. And I said, I, I, I kind of figured. How are you? He goes, well, you know, you've been telling me all week to take breaks and get out of the room. I said, I have. Did you? He goes, well, you know, my sister's been on me because, you know, Dr. Garoni said to take breaks and get out of the room. And so my sister's been harassing me like all day. I said, so did you? Yeah. Finally, I said, F it, F it, F it, F it. I'm going to take a walk. I'm going to get a break. And I said, great. How'd you do? I went out for a walk. I said, great. How'd you do? He goes, I knew my dad died during the walk. I said, how did you do? He goes, I came back into the room. And as I was walking through the door, knowing that he was dead, I felt him give me a hug. And I said, so you're okay. And he said, yeah, I'm okay. I didn't think I would be, but I'm okay. So this issue of taking breaks is really important because the loved one may not need you there or may not want you there to watch that last breath. The four walls can drive you crazy. You've got to be able to get some perspective, which is getting out of the room to be able to do that. The ugly truth is that all of us are going to get sick and die, right? It doesn't mean that life was worthless. I, I love talking to people who are like, well, you know, from the day you're born, you're dying, so why bother? That's a really long time to be bored. You know, it just is. So there is meaning and there is purpose and there is reason to seek joy and there is reason to be in, you know, in love with somebody, in love with life, to connect at the spirit. So let's talk about our ladies. Anne, remember, was the 59-year-old uh, lady diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. She was widely metastatic at diagnosis. She hit my hospital with a leg that was gangrenous due to white clot syndrome. She's in my ICU, and uh, she has these vital signs that are incompatible with life, and we're contrasting her with Kathleen. So Anne, interestingly enough, she's in my ICU. She's unconscious. She has a ventilator that is on room air, and it's really not breathing for her. Her heart rate is 185, her blood pressure is 40 over 20, her oxygen level is 20. None of those vital signs are compatible with life, but Anne was not dead. And I couldn't, I couldn't explain that to the family. So the family kept, there were three daughters and a spouse and some son-in-laws, and they kept leaning over the bed and patting her on the, on the remaining leg saying, it's okay, you can go. And, and every now and then that oxygen level would bop up from 20 to 24, but she wouldn't go. And they're looking at me going, why won't she go? I don't know. It's not her time yet. So I said, tell me about her. And they said, well, you know, she started her life as a nun in the Catholic Church. I said, no kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she, she liked religious life, but she really wanted to be a flamenco dancer. <laughs> I said, how did that go over with the, with the convent? Yeah, Mother Superior, not so interested in her being a flamenco dancer. So she left the convent to go be a flamenco dancer, but figures out that dancers get really terrible pay. So she needs money to be able to dance. So she goes to the California correction system and becomes a prison guard. So she's a prison guard by day in the women's prison and a flamenco dancer by night. So I'm laughing at this point because I think this is pretty freaking hysterical, right? And so I'm just laughing and I said, so the inmates must know not to cross her. And they said, oh, yeah, the inmates all know. Like, you can mess with that one and joke with that one and screw that one. But my mom, mm -mm, she'll have it out for you because, you know, like she was a nun. She's got eyes in the back of her head. She knows where they all are. <laughs> so they're having all of these really funny stories about her. And as they're telling the funny stories, you could watch her oxygen level go from 20 up to 27. And then it would bop back down to 20. And they kept saying, why isn't she dying? I'm like, I don't know. Those are not compatible with life. But there's something about her that is not done yet. And so they kept saying, Mama, it's OK. It's OK, Mama. You can go. It's OK, Mama. You can go. And she's like, yeah, those vital signs are just clicking right along. 
And it's been about an hour and a half and I'm getting a little bit thirsty and all of a sudden it dawned on me, well, shoot, they've been here twice as long as I have. And if I'm a little bit thirsty, they got to be really thirsty. One of them should have to pee like, you know, something should be going down. So I looked at him and I said, one of you should have to pee. One of you should be really, really thirsty. Why don't you take a break? I'll stay. I'll sit with her and I'll just page you overhead if something happens. But let's let's get your bodies taken care of because you've been here a long time. And so like, really? Yeah, really? I think you should. And so they give her a kiss. Mama, we're going to go get coffee. We're going to go pee. We're going to take care of ourselves. And as they're walking through the door, she flatlined. And it wasn't this gradual, you know, 40, 20. It was flatlined. And I'm standing looking at the monitor going, help me. Check that. That's kind of interesting. And her daughter is standing in the doorway looking at the monitor going, what does she just do? (laughs) And I looked at the daughter and I said, I think she died. And the poor daughter now falls over in the doorway, right? She's just beside herself and she's sobbing. And I went over to her and I picked her up and I said, you have just spent the last hour telling me that this woman is really bossy and does things her way and it's her way or the highway. And she said, well, yeah. I said, she just did things her way. And, and the daughter said, well, you know, she actually never really did take us at our word. We had to show her, right? So if we said, I love you, mom, she said, prove it. And so when we said it was okay to go, mom, we're pretty certain her thought was prove it. Leave the room. Show me that you will take care of yourself. Prove it. And when you prove it, then I'll go. And she has stayed with me my whole career. I took care of her over 20 years ago. But I, see, I keep her in my heart all the time because I watch families try and refuse to leave the room. I watch families refuse to take care of themselves. I watch families refuse to live their own life because they are so tied up in the dying. And Anne said, to hell with all that, right? It's my body that's dying. It's not your time. You have to continue living. You have to take your life on forward. Now, Kathleen was different, right? Kathleen is 16. She's not had much of a life yet. Kathleen had sarcoma, bone cancer, diagnosed in her leg. It had spread like wildfire. So Kathleen, now I get called on Friday. She's on 900 milligrams of morphine an hour. She's awake and screaming because she is in so much pain from cancer in every single vertebra that's irritating the nerves coming out of her spinal cord. When I met Kathleen on Friday, it was very clear to me that she was dying. And it's, you know, I feel bad because like that terrible movie, The Sixth Sense, I see dying people. I see dying people. Okay, fine. But I went out to the doctor and I said, that kid's dying. And the doc said, oh, no, she has no exit clause. I said, what? What? She goes, well, she's 16. I said, yeah. And she has cancer in her bones. Yeah. But her organs are fine. Her heart's fine. Her lungs are fine. Her brain is fine. Well, her brain's not fine. Um. That's not fine. Well, but yeah, she has no exit clause. Her organs are fine. She is going to die, but it's, it's like weeks or months away. She's not dying now. And I'm thinking, uh, I don't know. So I worked with the kid all over through the weekend. By Monday morning, I had her on 90 milligrams an hour of methadone. She was comfortable. Mom is at bedside. Mama is not coping well. Now, If you've ever lost a child, you realize that that breaks every freaking rule of the universe. There is no reason children should die before parents. It's just one of the most awful things humans go through. And so mom is at bedside. Mom is a little bit loopy herself on a good day, but now she's got a kid dying. So mom is just crazy. And um, the kid is hallucinating, according to the nurses. And when I walk into the room, she's clearly looking at something that I can't see. But I don't think she's hallucinating. I think she's talking to the other side. This kid is also clearly dying. It is so obvious on Monday that she's dying. This whole no exit clause thing was a bunch of crap. She's actively dying. And so I I asked the nurse and my chaplain, my palliative care chaplain, we need to come back this afternoon. Mom and dad are divorced. Mama can't handle that this kid is dying. I need dad. I need dad in this room because we need to coach him that this kid is dying. And I need him to midwife her into heaven or whatever comes next. And and we need to get him ready because mama's not going to be able to handle this. So we went into the room at three o'clock. Kathleen now is unconscious. She's lying in bed, she's very still. I kept mama at bedside and we made small talk. And I don't even remember what we talked about. It was just a bunch of small talk nonsense. Dad's over in the corner with the doctor and the chaplain. And they're they're talking about the fact that Kathleen is dying and, and what that's going to look like. And all of a sudden Kathleen goes. And I'm looking at it going, that's kind of interesting. And there's dead silence in the room, pardon the pun. Nothing. 
doctor doesn't say anything, chaplain doesn't say anything, mom and dad don't say anything. And I'm like, really? Really? You're not going to say anything to this unconscious kid who's waving at the ceiling. Okay, fine. So the next thing, about five minutes later, she does this. And then brings her hand down. Now dad speaks up. Dad says, what is she doing? And the doctor says, I don't know. I think it's like the Sistine Chapel. And all of a sudden I remember, right, the Sistine Chapel. And I said, well, yeah, I, I think she's talking to the other side. I don't think we're alone here. I think she's letting us know that she's getting ready to transition and leave this body. And Mama, of course, thought that you know I was crazy, and that's fine. But we left the room about 4. By 6 o'clock or 6.30 that night, the room was full of people. Kathleen was awake. And she had several siblings who were in the room. Mom and Dad were in the room. Friends of Mom and Dad were in the room. The room was full. And she looked at Mama, and she said, Mama, Aunt Isabel's here, and she says to tell you she loves you. And Mama started crying because Isabel had died 20 years prior. So Kathleen only knew of her through story and lore. She had never met her. She looked at Dad's friend, and she said, Your daddy's here, but I can't say his name. And he started crying, and he said, My dad's dead, and he speaks Tagalog, so you wouldn't be able to say his name. She named five or six dead people who were in the room. And then she went unconscious again. She died that night at 11. And as I expected, Mama had not handled this well. And so Mama's jumping on the bed trying to call a code and trying to do CPR on this poor child that has cancer in every bone. And it was her siblings, ironically. So I had prepped Dad. I prepped the wrong person. Her siblings jumped on the bed with Mom and grabbed Mom and pulled her off the bed and said, Mama, she told you where she was going. She told you who was taking her there. She told you she was okay. Let her go. Let her go be with those people. Let her be free of this body. And Mama it was interesting because she could stop, right? She, she had her meltdown, but then she could stop. And I saw Mama the next year at Survivor's Day and, uh, and Remembrance Day, and I asked her, how are you doing? And she said, you know, I, I'm better than I thought I would be. You got these other kids. You got to raise them, right? You can't just stop living your life. But I, I didn't think that I would be able to get back up and go again. And my kids have gotten me there because they were able to help me through that. And Kathleen and all of these patients have taught me that only bodies die. Love doesn't die. I think there is something called human spirit. I don't know anything about it. They don't teach it in med school. You've got much smarter speakers coming up than me who can speak to spirit. But I don't think spirit dies either. I think those continue on, and I think they stay connected to us if we allow them to. Hearts break open, but they do not break apart. People don't have to go crazy just because they are sad. They are sad, and sadness heals. And it doesn't heal completely. Your life is not going to go back to normal. Your life changes to something different, but that doesn't mean that it's not worthwhile or meaningful. And that timing of death, nothing to do with doctors, nothing to do with medicine, that is completely in the control of the spirit. And I've had to teach families over and over again, I have nothing to do with it. That spirit will choose the moment. And if you weren't in the room, it's because they didn't want you to have the memory. And looking forward, my wish for all of you is to remember, right, that no one has the right answer for how to cope. There's many different ways and many different approaches. Today is just one suggestion, one doctor who's bringing stories from the field. And um, no one tells us how to die. So I think that we have a choice in how we live. My experience is that that choice of how we live usually ends up being how we die. So when I have people that are wild and crazy in life, they're pretty wild and crazy in death, too. When I have people that are avoidant in life, they're pretty avoidant in death. That, that, that central core of who we are seems to continue. And I'm OK, right? I, I will always tell my patients and families, everything I've said could be wrong. I can't prove it. I can't study it. I can't do research on it. It's just my experience from the field. So I could also be wrong. And I'm OK with that, because right now, all I have to go on are these lessons and these experiences and these patients teaching me and showing me, trying to find some grace and hoping that there is something bigger and, and thereafter. Questions for me? Yes. How 
So the caregiver who is taking care of a patient that has been an abuser is really, it's, it's really difficult. And um, I have had some families where we have had to move the patient to board and care or nursing facility to get the caregiver away because they just can't, right? And, and there was a question in the first hour about how do you not repeat trauma? And that's where I worry. If I've got somebody that's with, a, a, the patient has been mean or nasty their whole life, I probably need to find other caregivers if it's at all possible. And if it's not for financial reasons, then we need to have extra support for that caregiver because we are going to relive old injury. Two more questions? Yes. So thank you. Well, thank you for being aware of what this is doing to your caregivers and, and having that spirit about you of, I, I'm in this place of facing my own mortality, which oh, honestly could give you the right to be crabby and mean. And, and, and so, so you're not. And, and that's honestly the first gift for the caregiver is how do I face my own mortality with some sense of grace? Because by you showing that grace, you show those of us around you how to be graceful. And then really beginning to have some plans of where's the line in the sand. So for me, I, we joke that I've already picked out my nursing home because I don't want my husband wiping my butt, right? Seriously. So I, I kind of know that, and I've told him, it's okay to either we'll hire somebody or I'll move to the nursing home when that stage happens. So having some sense of how much, how much dependence can I put on somebody else and, and when would I want them to do something different? And I think the gratitude you're showing is probably the biggest gift of all. One more question? All right, thank you all so much for your time.